This is the 18th edition of the Adio Grand, uh, a long series of symposia made possible thanks to the generosity of the Sudavar Memorial Foundation. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome here today some of the trustees of the, of the foundation. Uh, and I'm also very happy to see Dr. Sarah Stewart, uh, Emeritus Reader at SOAS, who initiated this series a few years ago. I would like to extend a special thanks to Fatima Sudavar uh, for her precious advice in the realization of, of this event. And I would, uh, would like also to express my gratitude to uh, SOAS Professional Service Team, to our student ambassadors who are helping today, uh, to Peshman Akbar Zadeh, uh, Akhil Borzi, and especially to Imogen Edwards, who overviewed every aspect of, of this symposium. It is for me a really a great honor to co-convene this symposium with Charles Melville, Emeritus Professor of Persian History at Cambridge University, founder of the Pembroke Shanami Center for Persian Studies, and editor of uh, public, proceedings, uh, public proceedings of the Adi Obiran series. And I must say that as a student, I was greatly inspired by Charles in the occasion of events in Cambridge and Serenius. Well, th that's all from my side. I wish you to enjoy this wonderful lineup of speakers that we have for today and tomorrow. And on that note, I would like to hand over to Sadi Sudavar. Um, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, I wanted, on behalf of the Sudavar Memorial Foundation, to quickly pay tribute to Iraj Barizadeh. Many of you will have known him. Since our last gathering for this Idea of Iran series, uh, he passed away uh, last year. He was often amongst us uh, over the years. And I want to pay tribute uh, to his legacy, to Middle Eastern studies. Um, Iraj's legacy was immense as the founder and publisher of I.B. Taurus. Uh, I.B. Taurus was named after the ancient name of his hometown of Tabriz. And on his passing, he left a legacy of over 4,000 titles. He founded the publisher to fill a gap in the West, focused, as he thought, on Greco-Roman and European civilization to cover uh, Middle East studies, Iranian studies, the history of Central Asia and Islamic art and architecture. And th that legacy is um, you know, quite a, a profound one. And we were very honored at the Suit of Our Memorial Foundation uh, to work with him at Ivy Taurus, now part of Bloomsbury, in publishing these series. Um, you'll see in the program that they're available uh, to purchase in terms of the back catalog, the last one being the contest for rule in 18th century Iran. And we hope soon uh, to see this one in publication as well. With that, um, I'll hand over to Charles. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ariane and Selma. Also, of course, my uh, pleasant job is to thank everybody who's already been thanked, so it's uh, very repetitive. But um, I'd just like to thank Mariane for sort of picking up the baton so smoothly from Sarah. Uh, and. Uh, carry on as though there'd be no change with Sarah, I'm sure, helping in the background. Uh, so it's great to um, be able to keep the series going at SOAS. I'd also, also obviously like to thank uh, Fatima and Leila, who um, of course know much more about the Qajar period than anybody else, because <laughs> they're sort of inhabitants of it. And um, so drawing up the programme has been very much a sort of a joint effort with me proposing some things and Fatima and Leila proposing many others and coming up with a, a gorgeous, I hope, compromise. So thank you for that. And uh, just to register um, uh, sadness that Leila can't be with us because she had a bad fall and uh, is unable to travel, so she'll be making her presentation online. Um, just briefly about the conference, of course, there's so much one could say about the car jars. We could have a whole week, really, and not cover everything. Um, but I think it's important to um, remember that the idea of the series isn't just to have a conference about the Qajars. It's about uh, the idea of Iran, and that means uh, and the whole series uh, is to think about how the idea of Iran was formed 
in the different periods that we've been covering from the first antiquity up till um, the late 19th century. Uh, and probably the Kaja era is when this idea of Iran, or a modern idea of Iran, really began to be formed, not only, I would say, in the West, uh, but probably also in Iran itself, uh, through the exposure to other countries and the, the real lived experience of visiting each other's countries, I mean, the Iranians to Europe, the Europeans to Iran, uh, and all the consequences for that, both uh, politically and socially and economically. But of course, while all that was going on, what you might call the history, people were forming an idea of the people they were working with, the country they were visiting, and uh, the views they had, of course, becoming increasingly uh, prolifically expressed. Uh, and so really, with that in mind, um, we've got a program for the next couple of days devoted, I hope, to putting the historical and economic and social context, of course, in the back of our minds, but just thinking about how we all formed an idea of Iran in that period, and the sources for that, that, that uh, idea, uh, and also how the Iranians, in a way, discovered themselves, if that doesn't sound too uh, patronising, it's not supposed to be. I mean, it was becoming aware, in other words, of um, their place in the world and relationship with neighbouring countries and neighbouring peoples. So I think we don't really need to go on that clock, it's apparently 10 to 4, it's like the clock in Grantchester, where it's stuck on 10 to 3. <laughs> So anyone casually glancing up there to see if they're running over time will be disappointed because there's that famous story about someone uh, giving a speech and listening to his watch and saying, I can't believe it. <laughs> it's, it's still only that and then realising the watch would stop. But anyway, so um, there we are. So I'd like to get going because I think we've already started a tiny bit late and um, invite our first panel and uh, please enjoy the conference and participate with your questions and discussion uh, and I hope we'll have a very fruitful uh, couple of days. Thank you very much. I am Negar Habibi and I'm a lecturer of the arts of Iran and Islam at the University of Geneva and I'm so honoured to start our uh, two-day symposium uh, by this fascinating panel, which is about the discovery of ancient Iran and its treasures with two speakers. So our first speaker is Dr. Lindsay Allen, a senior lecturer in ancient history in the Department of Classics, King's College, London. She has published on the extraction of antiquities from Iran in the early 19th and 20th centuries. And her today's talk is uh, titled Material Culture and the Construction of Iranian Antiquity. Please join me in welcoming her. This is a, um, an exploration of the way in which we talk about um, antiquity or ancient remains, um, most particularly Persepolis, as a foundational element of um, Iranian national identity in the later, in the modern period. Um, and I'm going to start with um, some observations on my background. I'm then going to talk about recent narratives of the role of antiquity in um, Iranian nationhood um, in academia. And then I'm going to follow an idiosyncratic trail <laughs> through some evidence um, in order to look at the um, multiple voices, the multiple narratives of antiquity uh, that use depictions or inspirations of um, material culture through the 19th century and into the 20th. Um, so to start with, this is my, as it were, my background. Um, I um, have come from an a, a ancient studies um, context, uh, looking particularly at the history of antiquities um, and the survival of uh, material culture from antiquity and how it's interpreted. Um, my initial publications on the 19th century um, dealt with really the English language side of um, this study um, with um, the East India Company's, British East India Company's involvement overland in progressive, let's say, depredations, uh, particularly at the site of um, Persepolis Takhtar Jamshid in Iran. And that is a um, 
publication from over 10 years ago now, uh, with funding from um, the Iran, uh, Iran Heritage Foundation and from the Sudan Memorial Foundation. I visited a number of archives in order to trace the histories of 19th century fragments from Persepolis. This is a diaspora, though, that really started in the 18th century, and I'll make a couple of um, kind of references back to the 18th century as a relevant starting point in other respects. Um, the image that you see on the far left um, is actually from De Bruyne, a, a, an early 18th century traveller who himself brought elements, pieces, back from Iran in order to support the accuracy of his drawings that he then published, uh, according to his own account. Um, on the left, on the, just to its right, you see another piece that James Justinian Maurier brought back, and it's still missing, so if anybody's seen it, let me know. Um, uh, as part of his own role as a secretary in the British Embassy of um, Seagal Easley in 1811. So that's my sort of initial English language background. Um, from that point in the early 19th century where we have effectively a, a British political spoliation of the site, um, the progressive revelation really of material antiquity in the 19th century is interpreted as a progressive narrative normally, as a, a narrative that builds accuracies upon accuracies upon accuracies and reveals more and more um, about those realities. Um, and I'm not completely disagreeing with this way of talking about um, the, first of all, the drawings of uh, sites, um, then photography, photography of sites, then the better photography of sites, and then an increased degree of detail in um, uh, surveying of them. Uh, but I do want to sort of critique that a little bit and to ask how we can um, tell that narrative. Uh, from a recent article by Christopher Etty, I'm actually writing about um, one of the most important uh, Persian language and uh, publications on antiquity of the 19th century, Fawcett al um, Bala Shirazi, on the remains of Iran, the ruins of Fars. She comments the rediscovery of the Achaemenid past, which is to some extent essential to the birth of the modern national idea of Iran, is part of his uh, legacy. Also, uh, more recently in 2021, um, there is the sort of overall linking of the clarification of material antiquity, let's say, to political eras within the, um, within the Iranian state. She comments, Safavid collapse leads Persian scholars and artists to grapple with new conceptions of universal history by re-evaluating the place of Iran in that universe during the turbulent long 19th century Gradually but surely, she says, Iran's antiquities were recast according to the terms of the present. So there's quite a lot of discussion of uh, the recovery of knowledge, the uncovering of knowledge, as a conversation with challenges from European historians um, and from um, larger narratives of history, uh, which I would like to emphasize is not completely wrong. Um, However, I do think there's also regional histories and community histories to be uncovered here. Um, just to start with, I want to sum up what I think is part of um, Grigor's argument underpinning the statement, uh, the second statement. Um, and I'm going to just sort of complicate that slightly as a lead into my own narrative. And I want to emphasize, I think this is a wonderful book, this recent book, The Persian Revival, which was desperately needed. Um, and gives a really fantastic introduction um, to um, the evolution of a, a sort of Persianate idiom in modern architecture through the 19th and 20th centuries in Iran and India. Um, as a sort of backstory to this influence, to this movement, Grigor cites uh, a start in the 18th century, with, specifically with the translation of the Avesta uh, and of other associated texts these texts influenced European theories of linguistic, religious and racial, notably diffusionism, with a growing emphasis on that racial element um, as the century went on. She also cites the sort of axis of transport and relationships between individuals connected by that transport of Britain in India, i.e. the governorship of Bengal, um, the Persian Gulf the Persianized, as it were, East India Company, these are individuals who um, are really staffing the government in India, but are deta detached from that, and rather more, like Sir John Malcolm, uh, the Uslis, and others, 
rather more um, semi-detached from that and used as um, post holders who liaise with um, the Iranian elite via the Persian Gulf. I'm going to come back to my MB there later. She notes that following the East India Company involvement, there is a rise in European travel narratives, uh, which is true. There's a greater proliferation of print records of, um, of Iran, and that's something we'll think about more about as the conference goes on. Um, and she also notes that the increasing complexity of reconstructions and documentations, uh, first um, in architectural drawings and then in photographs, as something which represents a European search for a new or more specific and racialized form of architecture in Iran. Um, and I'm just going to sort of leave that point aside because I think it's a really interesting one, um, but is more to do with her thesis for the rest of the book than mine today. So my complications of this progression of her thought um, I include um, a sort of additional historical context on the academic side. So I want to point out that not just um, the Avesta is being um, translated in the 19th century and therefore made available uh, more, more widely um, by intermediaries with uh, European language speakers, um, but that is an essential part of the process of the decipherment of Old Persian cuneiform, uh, which is done remotely in Europe, in Groningen, um, via copies of short inscriptions from Persepolis specifically. Um, this is a process that's often linked with uh, Bizetun and with Rawlinson, but in fact it starts at Persepolis um, in the late 18th and early 19th century. This knowledge is not taken up systematically until the 18 teens, a little bit, and then the 1830s, when it is used by scholars such as Rawlinson to start unlocking other ancient languages um, written in cuneiform languages. And this is where I have my NB. Beware assumptions behind these European visitors having classical schooling exclusively. Uh, John Malcolm and Porter, Robert Coe Porter, who may be well known to some of you as an artist who visited Iran in the 18 teens, um, they did not really have a secondary school education. Um, and Malcolm in particular learned Persian, as it were, before he probably learned any Greek. Um, William Oosley, who was a kind of the voice of knowledge, the voice of scholarship within the Sigur Uzli, um, his brother's uh, uh, academic, um, diplomatic mission. Um, he was a Persianist, and Robert Gordon, his fellow uh, diplomat, commented that he was not a Grecian, he didn't have Greek. Um, so all of these individuals are actually trying to access the, his, the Persian knowledge uh, that they're encountering as they visit Iran. Um, and that knowledge, that discussion, does contribute to the later decipherment of other cuneiform languages, um, Akkadian, um, and then later Sumerian and Elamite. In the 1840s, I also want to note that the rediscovery of ruins in Mesopotamia, in Ottoman Mesopotamia, um, means that um, the focus shifts away, to a certain extent, from Pas um, Persepolis and Tahti Jamshid, from the, the feeling that Persian texts would give um, Europeans knowledge of antiquity. That's much more of a, an 18th century vibe than a mid-19th century vibe. At the same time, despite that kind of, oh, there's not quite as much information there that we thought, feeling that is beginning to emerge in academic, um, academic discussion, the access to Iran overland vastly increases, um, so that it becomes more of a recreational destination, often by military officers, um, and steam, um, direct government um, via military detachments in India, um, access via the Suez Canal, and then later on the sort of um, institution of telegraph links um, between Europe and India mean that there's a great more facilitation of access to um, um, archaeological remains in Iran by multiple different um, uh, groups, including Europeans. So to sort of sum up, um, to kind of complicate what uh, Grimoire is, is proposing, um, those excavations of the mid-19th century actually decenter Iran and Persian narratives um, on antiquity um, and really make it much more of a niche um, occupation um, within ancient studies and archaeological studies because the Assyrian um, remains at their, their kind of scale um, kind of reveals um, more material effectively, much more, more and more, more monumental material to be um, spoliated, to be extracted and taken to Europe. 
Um, at the same time, there is a sort of ongoing um, investment in the documentation of antiquity in Iran. And I want to note that quite a lot of the evidence that we have for um, detailed uh, um, documentation from the middle of the 19th century onwards is, is internally sponsored, is effectively Iran-supported. Um, this is a quotation from Grigor noting that the photographer Luigi Pesce um, gifted um, uh, the king an album of photographs from Persepolis. Um, Nasruddin Shah being more excited about them being photographed is perhaps understandable if you know his penchant for photography. Um, but um, I do want to kind of caution against this decentering of the ruins of antiquity in um, the royal Iranian gaze, as it were, here. I want to sort of, again, problematise that. It's not that um, uh, necessarily antiquity is being lost sight of. This is a sort of joint enterprise. I also want to note that there's something else going on when Pesce um, photographs Persepolis and then gifts these uh, photographs to the Shah. He is employed within the Dar al-Fanun, um, the um, sort of new technical college founded in Tehran in order to support industrial and intellectual development in the new capital. Um, and he and his colleague seem to have visited Persepolis together. Um, and I can tell you that because his colleague was uh, August Kurtzic, who is famous also for producing an early map of Tehran. Um, and I can tell you for certain that they <laughs> visited there together seemingly because Kurtzic walked off with a couple of pieces from um, the north facade of the Akadana. On the left, a piece in St. Petersburg in the Hermitage, and on the right, a piece in Vienna. The one on the left is sometimes attributed to Kerr Porter, it's not, it's Kurtzic. Um, they were taken at circa 1858. They immediately found their way to European collections, um, and their origins were more or less forgotten, I would say. But they were undertaken by employees of the Shah, um, in um, their kind of, as it were, technical studies um, of uh, the site. I would like to emphasise, I don't think, I suspect this wasn't authorised. I strongly suspect this wasn't authorised. Uh, and just to give you an image here, this is from the 1870s a photographic survey of the site showing you the hole that the Kurtzic piece uh, in Vienna was taken from. Um, so talking about depredations... <laughs> Um, and vulnerabilities of, of remains. I want to kind of take us back to the um, embassy of 1811, where we have Sigur Uzli being recorded in the Fasnameh and Nasseri um, by um, Hassan, um, Hassan el Fasai um, as appearing in Iran, in Persia, as uh, the ambassador to the Shah. Um, this is, I bring this up because this kind of brings up a number of different themes in how um, we find archaeological remains, material culture, um, being talked about in 19th century sources and even into the early 20th century. Um, I, I wanted to get, kind of emphasise here that this 1811 entry in, in the Fasnama um, is exclusively about Sigur Uzli in Iran and his career and how lovely it was and how amazingly well it went. Um, and then a tomb find in the northwest of the country, um, and then something else happening in Fars. So here is the account of a Mongol tomb being allegedly discovered underground in the mountain um, uh, in near Sultania. I've put to the right one of the very large pieces um, taken away from Persepolis by Usli's expedition. Um, none of that is mentioned in this history, and I just want to note that as well. So as the tomb discovery narrative goes on, the local governor of the region um, finds out about the initial plunder of this site um, and he recovers on his own account um, a, a number of exotic items and I include an Edmund Dulac image of Aladdin's cave because it seems to be um, taking that vibe. Um, so Abdullah Mirza recovers a tuft of feathers of strange mate to which fragments of rubies, emeralds and turquoises were attached, a girdle adorned in the same manner, a dagger with a gilt handle and sheath, some other gold, objects of gold, um, which might have been horse ornaments, a square bottle full of gold studded with jewels and full of water, a goblet of gold studded with rubies and emeralds. Um, and he, these he sent back to the Shah, which is him being a very good 
bought the Ukraine, <laughs> being a very good governor. Still, in 1811, the entry continues. All was brought to Tehran, handed over to the Shah, and put in the treasury. In response, when this became known in Fars, Hussein Ali Mirza Farm and Farmer gave orders to pierce the lids, sorry about the typo, of the stone coffins of the Kayanids, i.e. the Achaemenid tombs at over in the mountain above Persepolis, Tafti Jamshid. It says, at Tafti Jamshid in the district of Marvdash, so that a man might enter, i.e. go in and poke around. They did not find anything except a handful of fine dusts of the bodies of Jamshid, Kabus and Kobad. Now, how you take this anecdote um, is, is, is up for debate. I'm rather um, suspicious that this is a slightly um, undermining narrative to give to the governor of Fars for this era, that he was trying to have as good a find as another governor that he could send to the Shah, but he failed and he found the, sort of the dust of, 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 of disappeared kings. Um, it doesn't seem to have any repercussions for him from him at that point. He is reported elsewhere in the Fars Name as, as infringing various other sort of sacred precincts. Um, but within this entry for 1811, um, it's all about just the, the Shah's rearrangement of the offices of Fars, so the kind of the reorganization of administration in that province. I wanted to sort of jump though from Farm and Farmer's uh, uh, um, ex escapade at um, the tombs. By noting that this is not the only, he's not the only person defiling tombs in Persepolis in the early 19th century. Uh, if we do want to see somebody with a classical background who is travelling for leisure in Iran, we have an early example of that in the shape of Robert Wilson of Aberdeen, who took some antiquities back to Aberdeen as part of his finds. You see a very typical image of him in Ottoman garb. Um, he brought this costume back too um, on the Acropolis. Um, he reports um, that he is, is sort of then processing the information from this cuneiform decipherment of the early 19th century, which is what he's noting here, deciphering to which uh, Professor Grotefund has done much. Um, he's talking to Claudius James Rich, who is the East India Company resident in Baghdad. Um, so there are these, circulation, these uh, translations are circulating amongst this personnel. However, the translations that are circulating amongst these personnel um, mention Jamshid. <laughs> now Jamshid is not in the trilingual inscriptions, Achaemenid inscriptions of Persepolis, but what has happened here is that Rich, Ke Porter and others have all re-added Jamshid to their um, interpretations of some of the cuneiform inscriptions at Persepolis. Um, so this is an instinct that's not exclusive uh, to the Qajar elite, this is something shared amongst the European um, Europeans who, who um, explore these sites. Whilst he's there, Wilson also excavates on the terrace um, and he clears the earth in front of the tombs, again the ones that are reported as being ha having been opened in 1811. He, sa he says he found little worthy of my toil. He did take the arrowhead home. Um, I was unable to resist the temptation, he says, of seeing the contents of the sarcophagi in the side of the tombs, Therefore, he determined to blow it up with gunpowder, a sacrilege which cost me a pang, which is a, a phrase that, yes, uh, is, is remarkable, um, and will be a source of regret to future travellers as the top is now rent in twain. And this is true that one of the sarcophagi has a broken top um, in the Tafti Jajid um, tombs. Um, and this key word of sacrilege is something I want to uh, pick up on then to sort of talk about other responses to investigations of the ruins in the early 19th century. So just bear with me on this. One finds this um, in numerous different mentions of individuals digging at Persepolis. Um, and the kinds of narratives that are being reported are rather similar to that combination of elements in the Fars Nome of there being possible treasure, but also sacrilege of infringing on this, on this ancient territory. So, if for example, Richard Strachey, writing a manuscript letter to his father in 1803 about excavations with the um, diplomatic uh, embassy of Sir John Malcolm in 1800, saying that a report had reached Isfahan before us that we had discovered an immense treasure by digging at Persepolis. Um, yes and no. In fact, they had taken, he had taken this fragment away. This is now in Minneapolis, actually. Um, and this was the first piece um, from the site that we know of to have reached uh, England. 
Um, but this combination of um, the greed of foreigners, the greed, the possible greed of anybody trying to impinge on um, ancient sites, plus um, a sort of um, uh, responsibility that local uh, people felt about uh, the site um, continues. So, for example, um, in the 18 teens, Robert Kirk Porter visiting the site says, uh, a man of the village had lately thrown down a pillar on the Great Terrace and died the following day. Nothing of the kind was likely to happen again. The danger of such sacrilege, that word again, being now perfectly understood. So many dreams had foreshown his fate from Solomon or the devil that no man henceforward would dare put a finger on the fabrics. This idea that you can actually have a sort of slightly supernatural encounter with the ruins uh, continues in other sources. For, so, for example, again, another embassy visiting in 1827, um, here the report that there is a beetle that has this year proved very destructive to the crops in the plain. And the ignorant present peasants said that it was occasioned by the Europeans having broken a talisman which existed amongst the ruins of Persepolis and which used to preserve the grain from injury. Colonel Stannis, who was the resident of Bushia for the East India Company, the year before disinterred a number of sculpted stones, capitals of columns, and a flight of locusts appeared. Um, and the peasants immediately set to work to carefully cover up what Stannis had taken so much pains to reveal. And Alexander is pretty unsympathetic and scathing about this. Um, this is actually, though, a serious point to kind of make about the uh, communal ownership and protection of such ruins. Uh, this word talisman, again, like sacrilege, is an important keyword. Uh, elsewhere, leaping to breeze on the way home, Alexander and his party um, experience being given a talisman. Um, this is a piece of paper in this case, um, being inscribed with sundry, sundry strange characters and devices. This is a, a mo a, an object of protection for them. This is where I would need Matt Melvin Kushki to be here to <laughs> explain it as in his own paper. Um, the relevance of talismanic thought to statecraft um, in the early modern period, um, in which talismanic science effectively is seen as part of um, state political science and skills that protect the king, protect the court, protect, protect the realm. So I would suggest to you that this talismanic thought, which is dismissed by our European travellers, shows that um, relics, sites, antiquities, have all actually had an association as important, um, uh, important um, protective elements of the country, of the terrain, uh, for many centuries. Uh, this is a point that comes up um, as part of um, an argument that uh, Moy Carey and I made a, a couple of years ago now, um, that uh, Persepolis itself had an important status um, within um, the new Safavid um, kind of regime, let's call it, um, uh, of Shah Abbas, um, after his foundation, refoundation of his capital of Isfahan, um, and then the retaking of Ormuzd um, in the Persian Gulf as part of his um, assertion of control of the province of Fars. Um, I wanted to note then that these um, stories of uh, damage which result um, from bad governing um, is something that predates the identification of this site as Persepolis itself. So this idea that international esteem of Persepolis as a site that is connected with world history um, is the only thing that prompts people to value it is one that we should set aside because what we find here is this is Chilmanar, um, a site being visited in the early 17th century um, with the governor of Fars by um, uh, this ambassador de Gouveia, um, and there is already a story about governing protection of the site versus uh, local ruination. At the same time, that same governor of Fars, Imam Kali Khan, um, is later alleged to be himself destructive or possibly greedy in his infringement of the site, and this is again back in the 17th century. According to Chardin, um, writing rather later in the 1680s, 1670s, 1680s, uh, Imam Kali Khan visited Persepolis with a European who translated for him two lines of cuneiform. Of course, 200 years before this was actually done, so just to, just to be clear. 
Um, Imam Kuli Khan struck a stone lion's head with his scimitar, causing the ground to open and pour forth gold and silver that he loaded upon 60 camels to bear back to the king. This, so this is starting to um, ring a bell with our farm and farmer uh, narrative about the tombs earlier on. Um, that a governor should protect his province and should protect the important kind of cultural treasures of his province. And if he doesn't, it might be due to greed or competition or, or rivalry with others and so on. And I just wanted to add on to this um, a couple of points about um, the ways in which um, it's important that we see a lot of the Qajar neo achaemenidisms as I call them, that is, Achaemenid em uh, emulations of Achaemenid uh, motifs in the late 19th century uh, as part of this governance narrative about of different groups all claiming different, uh, as it were, um, sorts of protection over the province of Fars. So after a period of instability again in the Fars Nalme, um, this account suggests that the Shah put up his quarters in the Bagwanu, and that is a garden of uh, the farm and farmers, Presented the Shah with the sum of 200,000 Tuman in cash, i.e. doing the right thing, giving the Shah all his money and his treasures. Um, and during his four-year day's stay in that garden outside the city of Shiraz, um, the Shah dispatched detachments of horse and foot belonging to his escort to the southern districts of Fars. So he's kind of asserting his control over the whole area. Then he entered Shiraz in the splendour of Jamshid again. Uh, the revenue of Karkavus and established himself in the Bakili Palace. And I wanted to add here, and I think this has been pointed out by numerous other people, that the Zand throne um, from the previous, as it were, capital use of Shiraz, the shifting of government to Shiraz under the Zand dynasty, itself alludes to the iconography of uh, Persepolis with the um, throne being borne on the shoulders of followers, supporters, and so on. Um, so there is a direct relevance of the visible, at this point, the visible remains at Persepolis, showing um, a, a Persian king being borne on the shoulders um, of others, to the way power was being constructed in Shiraz in the late 18th century, which is then taken over by the Qajar king as part of his own building of his legitimacy. So it's not completely new, and I just wanted to give a shout out to the fact that we have an early image um, located by Moya Carey, of these throne supporters appearing in an image of Kai Kavus, actually in an illustrated copy of the Shahnameh from the early 17th century, now in Berlin. And we think in this case, we want to propose that this figure here is quite possibly the governor of Fars. <laughs> so what we have is repeated uses of this um, motif, um, this imagery, this uh, setting, um, of Persepolis to show loyalty to the king, support of the king. Um, and I just want, I don't have time to talk more about this now, but I wanted to note that our examples of Qajar rock reliefs across the country of Iran possibly include at least one from the local ruling family in Fars, as well as Fatali Shah, for example, um, across <laughs> the rest of the country. So we have a use of a sort of antique idiom to express this relationship, this governing of Fars. Um, I'm going to just point out that where we find motifs of this neo achaemenid enthronement in the rest of, um, of, sort of increasing, proliferating um, imagery of, um, uh, uh, of antiquity in Qajar Iran, we find it being used for Jamshid, uh, most particularly. Um, and I want to refer you to a really wonderful article by Farshid Imami in Roxburn Williams's Technologies of the Image uh, from a few years ago now for more detail on that. Um, but these examples um, then become incredibly um, uh, influential. Um, at the same time, the security, the preservation, uh, the conservation of the site itself is again being taken over by uh, a succession of governors of Fars. In this case, uh, from an inscription in the Palace of Darius uh, by Farhad Mirza, and this is just to summarise, again, another period of um, unrest in the 1870s this time. Uh, there is a putting down of rebellion. Uh, there is an execution um, in um, Shiraz, although I do want to note that in the 1860s, 
uh, a rebel was particularly executed at Persepolis, according to the Fars Narmai. So you could also disp display your executed rebels in Persepolis. Um, and as part of that restoration of power, there is a um, there is a clearing away of rubble in a site. This is reinforced in a second uh, inscription which talks about um, the obscurity um, that has been inflicted on, um, uh, on the remains, um, which uh, Farhad Mirza orders to be removes, removed uh, from the whole of the abode of Jamshid for the glory of his justice. Um, these are part of the results of um, that project, which um, includes um, the photographic, photographic documentation of the site, again commissioned by the governor um, for publication later in Berlin in 1881, um, which preserves a, a valuable document of the state of the site. Um, and um, as also as part of that era, we, we have an increased um, investment in decorative art derived from that, but almost exclusively amongst ruling elites. And I'm going to skip over this because I have too much detail. Um, I have another paper I can refer you to on the, on the carpet commissions, which show a very precise um, effort to mirror again very particularly this thing of um, the king being supported by his, his army, his ranks. Um, and one should note that although this is um, glossed in multiple places as resulting from European influence, it's, which is what these summaries are suggesting, I'll just flick through them, um, it's in fact really striking <laughs> that um, the um, image is not from recent photography of the 1870s, but it is in fact from an image pirated from uh, Robert Caporter um, from the 18 teens and then reproduced in a popular um, publication of the 1840s. And this is just a way of showing you that progression. This is all a rather broader um, range of iconography than just the enthronement, but one notes the kind of recurrence of the enthronement of the, as the thing being encountered in Persepolis and referred to um, throughout um, the mid 19th century. Um, I want to note that this is then adopted by local elites, including the Kashgai tribe, um, and uh, possibly, and this is just a sort of uh, thing putting out there um, as a kind of, um, okay, I thought I was going for 35, um, and um, that this is part of the uh, kind of, uh, uh, illum let's say, local elite ambitions. So all of this neo um is being um, um, sponsored and constructed within um, Shiraz and Fars. I'm missing out a, um, a, a, a episode of uh, plunder, uh, but uh, I just wanted to note that even by the early 20th century, the narratives of plunder of the site via sort of secret investigations continue um, in a narrative encountered uh, by a travelling soldier. Um, and in this case, the narrative places the governor of Fars again as a sort of hero who is uh, combating um, these um, contraventions of propriety. I'm going to end on a thing that takes us to Kalikian for the next paper, because I want to note that the person who was um, blamed, let's say, by, a de by Kalikian for taking some pieces out of Persepolis um, in the early 20th century was uh, of the Khawami family, um, possibly um, as a sort of a versus, as a sort of competition element with um, Khashgai tribes. So instead of just thinking about nationalism um, and national narrative, I want to also note that the, the, the actual evidence that we have for reflection on material antiquity in the 19th century talks about care for it, protection, scrutiny, but also um, intrinsic qualities that are relevant to communities and to local, um, local provinces. Thank you. This panel is entitled Foreign and Persian Perceptions of Iran. My name is Asif Ashraf. I am going to be chairing this panel. Um, we have two speakers. Uh, on this panel. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, David Mokfadel, was unable to um, uh, attend and uh, to join um, us here in person, but he has 
sent his lecture in to us by video. So um, I will introduce him and then uh, turn it over to our um, uh, projector where, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to hear his lecture on the talk then. And then I'll uh, introduce our second speaker, Charles Melville, um, afterwards. But a few words about David Motadel. Um, David is Associate Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and Political Science here in London. He's the author of numerous books, including a history of Muslim, uh, history of Muslims under German rule in the Second World War, published in 2014, and the recipient of uh, the Frankel Prize. Uh, he's also the editor of um, editor or co-editor of two volumes, uh, a volume on Islam and the European Empires, published by Oxford University Press in 2014. Um, and a just completed co-edited volume on unconquered states, non-European powers in the imperial age. He has also just completed, and I think it's um, going to be imminently published, a monograph um, uh, on the Shah's Grand Tour, Global Monarchy in the Age of Empire, and his lecture um, today, which he has pre-recorded for us, um, is related to this monograph that he will be publishing. So, so um, let's turn it over to virtual David. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I can't be um, there in London today, um, but I'm grateful to the organizers for allowing me to present uh, my paper here via Zoom. Um, I will speak for about 20 minutes. In the summers of 1873, 1878, and 1889, the Persian monarch Nasreddin Shah embarked on three tours of Europe. He was the first Shah ever to visit the continent. He dined with the Tsars at the Winter Palace of St. Petersburg, enjoyed receptions given by Prince Leopold II in Brussels, and attended banquets um, with the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef at Schönbrunn Palace. On his first visit to Paris, an endless crowd lined his ceremonial progress along the Champs-Élysées. No less splendid were his receptions in Britain, uh, where the Persians lodged at Buckingham Palace and exchanged orders with Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle. The Shah visited steel mills, attended the great naval reviews in the English Channel, enjoyed Madame Tussauds' wax gallery and performances at the Royal Opera. In Berlin, he discussed um, world politics and grand strategy with Chancellor Bismarck, witnessed an assassination attempt on Wilhelm I, and attended military maneuvers with Wilhelm II. Some years later, the Shah's son and successor, Mosafar Adin Shah, um, followed in his father's footsteps, and he too was received at all major European courts during um, three European tours in 1900, 1902, and 1905. The visits of the Shahs all became huge public events, attracting many thousands of onlookers onto the streets. In London, Mark Twain, who in 1873 was commissioned by the New York Herald to write an entire article series on the Shahs' stay in Britain, reported, I quote, the streets for miles are crammed with people waiting whole long hours for a chance glimpse of the Shah. I've never seen any man draw like this one. End quote. And this Shah mania was reflected in newspaper articles and caricatures, in cheap books and novels, and even in theater and operetta. And yet the visits were spectacular um, exotic events, not only in the eyes of the Europeans. To the Shahs, Europe appeared to be a remote, strange, and at times troubling place. They recorded their experience in detail in their travelogues, uh, which today provide us with a fascinating historical source. Um, historians have overall given surprisingly little attention um, to the European tours of the Shahs, um, if considered at all. They have been routinely dismissed as devoid of any political significance, um, as nothing but, uh, I quote, costly and useless, um, as the Orientalist Edward G. Brown once characterized them. 
And yet the Shah's own accounts um, explicitly contradict this perception, um, both um, claiming actually that uh, a major reason for visiting Europe was political interest. And while we should um, treat, of course, the Shah's statements with some caution, there is evidence um, that the visits did indeed have political implications. And this brings me to the bigger question, in, in a way, um, because the Shah's tours can be seen as, as part of a much wider um, historical phenomenon, um, because royal visits um, of non-European monarchs to the centers of um, European power, um, the European capitals, um, became recurring events during the heyday of European imperialism. They all came, Ahmed Bey of Tunis in 1846, Sultan Ab um, uh, Abdulaziz in 1867, the King of Hawaii in 1881, the Queen of Hawaii, sister in 1887, Sultan Abu Bakr of Johor frequently, actually died in London during his last day. Um, the King of Siam in 1897 and 19 of, um, 1907, various Japanese princes also um, came to Europe and so on. So this is a, a major historical phenomenon basically. And I've actually just finished a short book um, on those visits of non-European royalty to Europe in the era of high imperialism. It will come out in German this autumn. Uh, and there will be an, in, an English translation um, soon as well. In Europe, um, the visiting sovereigns and their ministers tried to engage in diplomatic negotiations, hoping for legal and military guarantees um, to secure their country's integrity in a world dominated by the expanding European powers. A world in which the few countries outside of Europe that remained nominally independent faced the threat of European imperialism. Of course, these deals brokered in Europe uh, could make their states even more dependent on the European power. So it was kind of like a, de a delicate um, political um, um, situation they were in. And yet there was another aspect of these visits that made them even more significant to the guests. And that was the ceremonial splendor of a state visit. A formal reception in a European metropolis offered non-European rulers the opportunity to present themselves on the same level as European monarchs. Their participations in the rituals and the ceremonials of a state visit gave expression to the monarch's dynastic legitimacy and the country's sovereignty. To a certain extent, the ceremonial aspects of the visits could so symbolically equalize, level, um, asymmetric power relations. So state visits offered, in a way, non-European rulers a way of integrating themselves into a system of international relations that was dominated by the European powers. In order to enter the system, though, it was essential for the non-European monarchs um, to interact within the same social framework of the European courts, taking into account codes of conduct and courtly etiquette in Europe, um, so the guests had to acculturate to courtly manners that resulted in parts, at least, from a very specific European um, development, the civilizing process, the process de civilization, as described by Norbert Ilias in the case of France, famously in early modern France. So basically, he was looking mainly at the control of bodily functions in the courtly sphere and how they came about. So when did you stop blowing your nose into the curtains and things like that? So there was this very specific European court um, um, etiquette. Um, and to gain recognition, the state staging of the visit um, had to meet the perceived European standard. And that was in the eyes of the dominant European powers, the standard of civilization. Uh, meeting this very standard seemed to be a key condition of becoming accepted as a legitimate and sovereign member in the global community of states and courts. Um, so we should perhaps also obviously, I mean, remember that um, notions of civilization, political legitimacy and um, territorial sovereignty were closely connected in most contemporary European legal theories. So in fact, statesmen, diplomats, legal experts routinely distinguish between different stages of civilization when dealing um, with the European countries. And usually the world was divided into three parts. 
or they were the civilized, the European countries, um, the half civilized, um, which you can see here, um, and then the uncivilized um, who could be colonized. Um, but as the, the concept of civilization um, itself was not very clearly defined, um, European policy towards non-European states did not follow clear lines, but was often ad hoc and pragmatic. Uh, and yet, although unpredictable, um, this international system left some room for action on part of the few independent non-European sovereigns. And the numerous and extensive European tours undertaken by them, and in our case, the Shahs, um, helped them to demonstrate sovereignty and to consolidate Persia's global position. I mean, Persia was very much on the margins of the international order, and you can see that um, very well here in this map of Europe, where Persia is still part of it, um, but basically just as a, a small lamenting man in the corner um, looking at Russia, and Russia looks hungry, uh, obviously, um, but still, still part of the part of the the map. Um, let me say a few words about the diplomatic history of the visits. I'll not bore you too much with boring um, uh, diplomatic history, but I think the, you know I should just give you briefly the context. Um, when he left Tehran for his first trip to Europe, Nasreddin was 42 years old. Um, in Iran, he theoretically at least possessed almost absolute authority, uh, although of course his reign was continually um, threatened by court rivalries, um, um, upheavals in the borderlands um, of, of Iran, and also obviously opponents like uh, segments of the ulama, which actually for most part opposed his journey to Europe. Um, and to prevent the palace revolt, the Shah took along with him nearly his whole government, including many potentially hostile functionaries. Um, in its foreign relations, the Qajar court uh, faced an increasing imperial threat from the Tsarist Empire, which, as it expanded into the Caucasus and um, Central Asia, threatened northern Persia, and also from Great Britain, for which Persia was obviously a buffer state in defense of the Raj. Um, we should also remember that um, Persia had suffered major military defeats um, against Russia in 1813 and then 1828, um, and also against Britain in 1857, um, so earlier that century, which made um, Qajar elites very aware of the country's vulnerability and the political significance of um, the West. So Europe wouldn't have been on the map to the same extent, uh, let's say, in the 18th century or earlier. So it was this particular moment in time where those visits suddenly became um, conceivable, thinkable, conceptualizable. In Europe, um, the Persian sovereign um, visitors, sovereigns, um, then engaged in various political negotiations in the hope for guarantees and treatises affirming Persian independence. Um, in the beginning, it was relatively easy um, for the Shahs to receive invitations to the European courts um, because the Europeans also had some interests. So, for example, in 1873, um, the newly founded German Reich, um, for instance, could also benefit both internally and externally from promoting itself on the world stage by receiving um, foreign monarchs. Um, the same is true for the Tsarist Empire, where the court always was kind of like eager to present um, Russia on the global stage as a great power, perhaps even a Western power. Um, British officials were keen to receive the Shahs as they were anxious that he would otherwise come under um, Russian influence. Um, and in 1873, Queen Victoria actually came down from Balmoral um, for the visit, even though she had largely withdrawn from public activity um, after the death of Prince Albert in 1861. So this was uh, a significant event also for the for the English for the British court. Over the years, um, the political gains secured by the Shahs during the visits shrank, um, because as rivalry between the imperial powers in Europe increased, um, most of the European states became more and more reluctant to sign treaties of friendship and to gain guarantees, um, especially countries like Germany, Austria-Hungary, France, Belgium, and so on, saw so Persia more and more as, as part of the Anglo-Russian sphere of influence, and this disinterest is um, was kind of portrayed once here in this uh, drawing um, 
showing basically Wilhelm II turning his back to um, his reign in China, 1889, symbolizing his interest. And it's perhaps not an, a coincidence that the Shah is also portrayed, basically depicted on the same side as the women and the children. But maybe I'm over-interpreting here. Anyway, finally, the, the Persian Constitutional Revolution, which broke out in 1905, um, late 1905, um, among other reasons, um, also over the collection of taxes to repay Russian loans um, for the Shah's last royal tour, uh, made further travel impossible. So um, now let me come to the second and perhaps more important part um, of this paper. Um, an important role why the Persians were so eager to be received in Europe was the visit's mere symbolic meaning. Um, the ceremonies employed for the Shahs during their visits um, did in fact not differ much from those usually provided for European royalty. And still in 1873, no one in Europe had much experience with receiving an oriental ruler, as it was often put. And in fact, um, officials in all of the European capitals looked to Russia, uh, where the Shah was first received and then decided to copy the ceremony from St. Petersburg. Um, even more important um, here was that the Europeans were willing to rank the Shah's royal status above their ethnic origin, or basically the foreigners and the remoteness of the geographical remoteness of the country they represented. Um, David Kennedine once called this crown above color. Um, so the Europeans kind of had a long tradition, um, which famously had been studied by Ernst Kantarovich, um, distinguishing between the monarch's physical and symbolic body, right, the, the king's two bodies, and the, the physical body in this respect, the, the weaker body, um, in the Shah's case, became less significant, um, and it was a symbolic body as a monarch that, that really counted in Europe. Um, and moreover, there was also this sort of um, solidarity among monarchs, um, that remained relatively strong, especially after the Congress of Vienna in the 19th century, um, a phenomenon that has been described as royal cosmopolitanism or fraternity of monarchs. And the Shahs benefited from these European conceptions, um, despite the weakness and the foreignness of the country they represented. During the visits, um, the Shahs were provided um, as a consequence with modern means of transport, like trains and steamships, demonstrating their authority in word of modernity, and they were accommodated in palaces and, um, and grand houses. The main streets of Europe's capitals were usually decorated with the Persian national colors, the hoisting of the Persian flag, symbolizing the monarch's authority and Persia's sovereignty. Also, the, the Persia insignia of the lion and the sun became part of the um, ceremonial iconography. And so this all held basically to, to the, the Qajar court to stage Persia on the global stage. And there's several visual representations of these entries of the monarchs in Europe, into European capitals here in, well, not a couple in this case, Moscow in 73, uh, Berlin with sitting next to Crown Prince Frederick um, in 73. The Shah also depicted a bit darker, maybe, of uh, complexion than, than he actually was. Um, then obviously the grandest entry uh, along the Champs-Élysées here at the um, um, Arc de Triomphe in, in Paris. Um, here's the entry in, in London and then in 1889 um, coming basically down in the Thames, um, disembarking at Westminster. Um, the Shahs, for their part, performed the ritualized European choreography of, of a state visit almost perfectly. Um, why is that? Well, first, they had no problems um, coping with aristocratic practices, which resembled those of the Qajar court. In fact, Europeans and Persians shared much ceremonial ground. Um, so among the common customs, the shared customs were, for example, hunting, um, very common both in Persia and in the European courtly sphere. Um, military parades, uh, another element also shared, um, and the exchange of decorations. I mean, hunting um, is just like you know one example here in Luxembourg Palace, but um, there are also many representations of, of the Shahs attending military reviews in Europe. And in, in Persia, there were, could be thousands of troops who were involved in public military reviews at the time. So um, very significant and something the Shahs didn't really have to adapt to, but 
share basically this common um, ceremonial ground. Um, same is true for um, gifts and decorations, also both important um, at the Kaja Accord. In fact, the Persians um, carried boxes of medals with them to Europe, and the most popular Persian decoration, the Order of the Lion and the Sun, um, had already been founded uh, by Fatali Shah in 1808, initially with the intention of honoring foreign officials. Um, Nasreddin then had also founded the Order of the Imperial Effigy, which um, he gave only to Europe's sovereigns. Um, he conceived the, the Order of the Lion and the Sun, obviously. There were five classes towards the end um, um, under Nasreddin Shah. And Nasreddin also founded um, the Order of the Sun for ladies, um, just um, on the eve of his first European tour to be able to honor European um, court ladies. And Nasreddin, in return, received the Belgium Order of Leopold, the German Black Eagle Medal, and um, even the Order of the Garter. Um, when Musafreddin visited England in the summer of 1902 and was only offered the portrait of King Egbert um, set in diamonds, instead of the Order of the Garter, he refused and deeply upset um, left England. And in fact, the episode led then to serious tensions in anglo Iranian relations and eventually special delegation had to be sent to Tehran to give the Shah the order. Um, and Vanity Fair famously portrayed this, made fun of this, showing Mossaf Radin basically proudly wearing the blue ribbon of the Garter. So all of these practices were shared by European and non-European monarchs. It would therefore be misleading to characterize them as intercultural royal visits or cross-cultural or transcultural visits as this would be to assume that the monarchs were separated by two different cultures. Um, in fact, we should be cautious to understand all relations between European and non-European monarchs in terms of a simple adaptation to or rejection of a seemingly fixed European standard. Um, throughout the modern period, royal practices had converged around the globe. And so um, there was this shared status-based, class-based, repertoire of symbolic um, actions and, and, and meanings they could draw on in these encounters. And yet other parts of the European ceremonial provided um, for the Shahs proved to be more difficult. They were not accustomed to sitting through long royal banquets, ballets, um, balls, operas, listening to music alien to their ears. And yet the Shahs proved a remarkable willingness to adapt to European customs here as well. Um, so, for example, they proved their ability to meet um, European standards in the ritual of the handshake, uh, which was unfamiliar to them. And in England, they, they would even perform the gesture of hand kissing when meeting Queen Victoria, um, as you can see here on the right um, during this 1889 visit. Um, in his diaries, he frequently um, explained these greeting rituals as Tarov, um, interestingly, so kind of like legitimized them um, as a kind of yeah, a pure gesture of, of politeness um, rather than maybe profound, uh, a meaning with more profound um, um, significance, political significance. Um, a more difficult obstacle were table rituals. Um, three months before the his first visit to Europe, Nasreddin, who was accustomed to eating with his hands, um, learned how to eat with European cutlery. Um, at Europe's courts, both shahs even adjusted to the ritual of toasts, raising their glasses to kings, queens, and empress, empresses. Um, and this was not easy for them, and they write about this in detail in their travelogues, how they copied, imitated um, their European counterparts, uh, but you know, frequently struggled. And finally, obviously, also the presence of ladies at official events caused difficulties. In contrast to the homosocial, gender-segregated milieu of the Kaja court, in Europe, noble women took part in most courtly activities. So male-female intimacy in the courtly sphere, such as a man leading a woman by the arm or public dancing at balls, habitually even with another man's wife, um, was new to Qajar nobles. Um, differences obviously were most explicitly exemplified in the physical appearance of court ladies, the public display of the female body and low-cut ball gowns, um, all described in detail um, in Nasreddin's diaries. And for the Europeans, this was also something, obviously in an Orientalist manner in a way, um, to, to, to portray in, in, in these kind of like visual depictions. So there are many 
um, pictures showing these encounters between the Shahs, the Persians, and European ladies um, at court. Um, in his travelogues, in, um, in, travelogues interestingly, Nasreddin often made um, very unflattering remarks about the aristocratic ladies of Europe. Um, there are many examples um, of Bismarck's wife, Johanna von Puttkammer, for example. He noted, I quote, Bismarck's wife is very, very, very ugly. Poor Bismarck, end quote. Though he later put her into perspective, um, I quote again, they introduced General Boyan's wife to me. The thousands of blessings upon Bismarck's wife. Amazing how ugly she was. Poor Boyan. His daughter was also very ugly, end quote. And I could go on and on here. There are many, many um, similar quotations. Um, and I was struggling with this for a while and, and initially thought, well, maybe it was just the power imbalance, the relatively powerful, dom um, more dominant um, role of women at court in Europe that, that kind of troubled the Shahs. And that is definitely an, uh, one factor, I think. But apart from this relatively powerful position of European noblewoman in court life, um, Nasreddin was particularly disgusted by the idea of beauty. Um, in his diary, he, he continuously commented on the artificial, even non-existent eyebrows of European noblewomen, the white powder that covered their faces and so on. And uh, some of you will know Afshani, Afsani Natchavati's Women with Mustaches and Men Without Beards on you know, se sexual aesthetics and sexuality more generally in 19th century Iran. Um, and, and when we read this together, we realize that, in fact, um, all these beauty standards in Europe, the powder, the white faces, the artificial thin eyebrows and so on, contrasted very unfavorably with the Qajar ideal of, of the thick monobrow, the Frida Kahlo um, thing they had um, over their eyes, or um, the rose-faced woman, the, the rosy cheeks, and, and kind of red natural cheeks, or even the visible down of mustache. So all these factors basically um, um, uh, contributed to um, Nasreddin's negative portrayal of, often negative portrayal of women. And you can obviously see the Qajar ideal of beauty, um, monobrow, um, rosy cheeks, and so on. No white powder or anything. Um, well, you know the, the pictures, the photographs of Nasreddin's harem, um, where you basically have a very different kind of like beauty standard represented there. And yet, despite all of these problems, both Shahs learned very quickly how to cope with um, unfamiliar gender roles and how to interact appropriately with European ladies at court, um, both regularly even escorted queens and empresses by the arm. So what was the reason for this adaptation to European standards? Uh, well, the Shah's adequate performance in Europe was not entirely um, um, uninterested. It was, in fact, in their own political interest to to fit in. And although the very adaptation to European etiquette implied recognition of European hegemony, um, these proper receptions at courts across Europe helped them to promote the image of their country on the international stage, and they were very aware of this and also reflected about this or on this in their diaries. And yet these royal visits, and I will come to the end here, um, were not without risk um, for the Shahs, since they could also expose cultural differences. In some cases, the Shahs simply could not cope with European customs. Indeed, the list of anecdotes of the Shah's improper behavior at court is long. Uh, most amusing to the European observers was the Persians' reluctance to remove the fur caps, um, the kola, um, during formal um, dinners, um, whereas according to European custom, one had to remove one's he headgear and keep one's shoes on when entering a room, um, Kaja etiquette dictated the opposite, basically, right? You kept your head on and, um, and took your shoes off. Um, more problematic, the Shah's lack of French, the lingua franca still, even at the late 19th century at European courts and also European diplomacy, um, uh, was was a problem. Um, both Nasreddin and Musafreddin um, could understand some French, uh, but were unable to speak it. Uh, what Musafreddin occasionally said, très magnifique, très bon, at intervals without any particular reason. Um, and this language barrier um, was a real burden to the Shahs, making their visit 
appear unusual in the European context. But in other cases, the Europeans too made some changes to the usual ceremonial. Um, parts of the decorations pro, um, provided for the shahs um, articulated stereotypical patterns of an oriental taste, um, which were mostly the creation of the European imagination and had little to do with Iranian reality. So palms, Persian carpets, colorful pillows, um, and so on were arranged. In Berlin in 1889, a Persian marquee was built um, at the train station to welcome the Shah. In London that year, gigantic oriental papier mache palace was constructed on the facades of some of the houses on the road to the guild hall um, the Shah passed um, by. Um, also look at the Shah's itineraries in, in um, Berlin shows that the visits to the theater were special as they were only shown plays on oriental themes like the ballet's Aladdin or Vincenzo Bellini's ballet The Buccaneer, um, all basically set in, in the Orient, articulating ori orientalist um, stereotypes. And usually the Shahs presented with these odd spectacles couldn't quite understand what the, the hosts were intending to signal. And at times they were describing these things like the der the, the tent in um, Berlin, Nasreddin described as a dervish tent. Orientalist art he would usually de describe as North African Maghreb Mag Maghrebi or, or, or Arab. Um, but he would never really identify himself with these Orientalist spectacles. Um, so in the end, because of this, lack of adaptation in parts of the Shahs and also because of the orientalization of the spectacle by the Europeans, um, the visit undermined the Iranians wish to be accepted as equals on the world stage. So let me conclude. Um, the Shah's visit to Europe played a, a central role in um, Orientalist picture here, uh, played a central role in um, the Shah's struggle for international prestige and recognition. And yet the question whether these attempts on the whole were successful or not is not easy to answer. Although the tours may have overall succeeded in affirming formal self-determination and sovereignty, they also made Persia militarily, economically, and politically more dependent than ever before, and eventually even caused domestic unrest. Thank you. Um, it was a real pleasure to present today. And um, I'm sorry again for not being there in person. Um, the book on the Shahs will actually be out um, um, relatively soon, hopefully within the next year. Um, so it's a great opportunity now to present um, some of the findings um, here. Um, have a great conference. See you soon. Without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction to many of us in this room, Professor Charles Melville, Professor Emeritus of Persian History at the University of Cambridge and a fellow um, of Pembroke College, Cambridge. Um, he was the president of the British Institute of Persian Studies from 2017 to 2023, and is also the director of the Shah Nama Project um, based at Pembroke um, in Cambridge as well. Um, he's the author of numerous books um, and articles, um, and, sorry, not so many, not so many <laughs> edited volumes, edited <laughs> volumes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. edited volumes, including the, um, being the editor of the three most recent volumes that grew out of um, the conference, these conferences, the Idea of Iran conferences. Um, he is um, also um, editor of A Short History of the Gid Memorial Trust and its Trustees um, and is currently uh, researching the visualization of Persian history with the Lever Hume Emeritus Fellowship. Uh, today he's going to be speaking on communications and the circulation of news in 19th century Iran. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Asif, for that, and um, for uh, Fatima also for entrusting me with carrying on organizing these conferences with the support of SAS. 
Um, uh, this is rather a work in progress. I know everyone always says that, but um, <laughs> when I stupidly uh, abused my privilege as organising these things to speak twice, which is not the given rule, I did give a paper on the longer period some time ago, um, I thought that I had quite a lot of interesting material that was still sitting in the vault, as it were, and this was a good moment to bring it out. And of course, when I uh, discovered that uh, the vault was rather firmly closed, <laughs> and uh, it was going to be quite a job digging it out, I started rather late in um, putting this together. Um, but um, nevertheless, I thought it would be worth trying to pull together various strands of things that are usually dealt with uh, rather and more separately. And um, this is to do with the question of communications and the circulation of news, uh, which is essentially another look at sources. Um, I'm interested in historiography generally. Um, and even in the medieval period, you might ask the question, somebody sitting in Isfahan reports news of something, it could be anything really, that happened in Mashhad, say. Well, how does he know what happened in Mashhad? How long did it take the news to get there? What even if you're living in Mashhad, how did you know what happened in Mashhad the previous week? I mean, how do we know what's going on in London now? It's not, you know, we all rely on written sources, but how do we know the origin of the material we're looking at? So I think this is a perennial question which applies to any um, any historical in investigation of any country or period. Um, but it seems to me it's particularly interesting um, in the Qajar period, where we are now, because there's an explosion of information, just as there's an explosion of information that we have uh, learned about the Qajar. I say we, I mean, you know, as a fact for imperialists in the 19th century. Um, news of Iran becomes far more prevalent and far better circulated. And uh, anyway, so there are various things happening more or less at the same time that I think makes this uh, particularly the case in the Qajar era. But well, my starting point, as often actually in some of my other work, is to see how one can apply topics of research in the field of European history to the case of Iran. For instance, the idea of an itinerant monarchy, uh, which I've written about a bit. And as we've just heard from uh, David Mutadil, uh, in the last quarter of the 19th century, the Persian Shahs travelled uh, extensively, both within Iran and abroad, and documented their journeys in considerable descriptive and chronological detail. So I'm not going to talk about the journeys abroad at all, because not only have we heard about them, but the point I want to discuss more is the circulation of news about Iran within Iran. Okay. Um, so the, the Shahs were travelling partly on military, uh, for military reasons, but also for relaxation. Uh, and um, we mentioned some of their travels again a little bit later. But they were itinerating, for instance, between summer and winter pastures, just like their Mongol and even Seljuk predecessors, uh, either to Sultanie or Firuz Ku, the Judge Rood and the Lower Valley, as is well known and frequently documented. One of Nasruddin Shah's earliest travelogues concerned his uh, trip to Khorasan in 1867, and his journeys in general established a mode, a uh, model for travel writing, as it, of course is well known. Uh, he wrote in a very simple style, like the women in Europe, you know, he didn't doll it up with a whole lot of Arabic sage. Uh, and um, this obviously stimulated a great um, amount of uh, travel literature and travelogues within Iran itself and, and people travelling, especially courtiers, of course, on government or other business. So the starting point then, as I say, is the question of the circulation of news. Uh, and there was a stimulating conference published 30 years ago, I'm afraid to say, uh, on the proceedings on uh, the topic of la circulation des nouvelles au Moyen Âge. This opened with a consideration of the vast network of papal communications established by Pope Gregory XI at Avignon, 1370 to 1378, but also the comparable needs of rulers, merchants, and bankers for rapid communications. 
Well, of course, there's a substantial difference between 14th and 15th century Europe and 19th century Iran. But the similarities are greater between both at that time than comparisons between them would be in the 19th century. Besides differences of terrain and political and bureaucratic development, the essential issues remain the same. The organisation of a relay system and couriers and the question of the speed of travel. Because it seems to me that speed is an essential for news. There's no point hearing about something that happened a few months ago, really. I mean, it depends. The importance of the information partly reflects how quickly it arrives. Um, so Iran, of course, had a long experience of such systems, from the Achaemenid's royal road to the implementation of the official Mongol uh, network, the Yarm, and its establishment of relay stations. This seems to have fallen into disuse in the Safavid period and was entirely broken down by the end of the 18th century, despite the continuation of the dispatch of riders uh, on official business uh, and foot messengers, Shatir, for official and more general purpose. So obviously people are still sending round messengers, uh, but the point is were the relay stations to assist the uh, the spread of news and the availability of horses at regular intervals and so on like this. So, uh, as I say, I'm going to pull together three or four different topics, um, which all uh, connect to the same point, essentially. So the first one is the Chata Khani, the, the, the post houses, um, as opposed to just people running around on their horses. So according to a detailed study by Wilhelm Floor, the use of relay stations continued informally early in the reign of Fasali Shah, but was not revived on a systematic basis as a formal postal service until the time of Nasr ad Din Shah in 1850-51, with the orders to rebuild and maintain a new network of Chapa Khane on the initiative of the Amir Kabir. Floor provides itineraries and approximate distances and sometimes times for nine of the most Travelled routes with Chapa Khane, so if you can see that, it's just um, distilled from his article, um, based on the appendices in a chap called Holmes, who was writing in 1845. Now, there are hundreds of others, of course, that's one of the problems. Um, well, I mean, there are thousands, <laughs> actually, of uh, itineraries and different estimates of the times and the distances between the stations and so on. But anyway, they were built as intervals of between three and six parsacks, which we can take as roughly 12 to 24 miles. It's the same in Europe. And it's obviously dependent partly on how quickly and for how long horses can keep going. Um, riders could cover roughly 70 or 100 miles a day, which is roughly the same time as we know express messengers were operating in the time of Shah Abbas. Numerous descriptions of these routes and distances and times taken are available from different periods. One of which, for example, by a chap called Robert John Kennedy on the route from Tehran to Mashhad using the Chapa relays, records 24 stations, uh, 24 stages with stations every 16 to 30 miles. So quite a big interval, obviously, depending on terrain. He measured the journey as 542 miles, which his small party covered in 14 days averaging, therefore, 38 miles a day. Well, we all know the Farsak is a movable feast, and it's difficult to convert this into, uh, into miles and kilometres at any particular time. The British travellers tend to use either Farsaks or miles, and they tend to assume measure it, but they're obviously all measuring it differently. Uh, so that's the route town to Mashhad, which is clearly one of the most important ones. Uh, the other major route is the southern route from Tehran down to Bushir, uh, for reasons that become obvious. When I was doing some early work on um, earthquakes, one of the things we did, which is one of the reasons I thought I had all this fabulous body of information, was hundreds and hundreds of travelogues marking their routes on a map. Hundreds of maps, in other words, one for each. Uh, and it's quite clear uh, that the main routes were north-south, Tehran to the Persian Gulf, what we call the A1 in those days, and now, and then also Tehran to Khorasan and 
in other words, a route across the north of the country in one route down there. I mean, it's obvious, but still you can document this uh, very clearly. C.J. Wills, who was uh, in Persia on and off between 1866 and 1881, estimates the journey between Tehran and Bushir following the postal stations as 205.5 parsecs in 38 stages. Um, but as I said, there are many other views of this. So I'm only mentioning these details, which of course could be taken slightly tedious, uh, to show that um, there was a system uh, and it could go at various speeds, uh, but it was an organized way of transferring news and information uh, across the main arteries of the country. <coughs> Well, the rate of travel for non-journey, for non-urgent journeys, using the system varied greatly, depending, of course, on the reasons for travel. Uh, I think it's important, as I mentioned, to say why uh, we need to know the speed, because um, the reliability and speed of communications affect not only the reach and efficiency of government control, but also implies how urgent or significant the news might be considered for both the sender and the recipient. Daily records clearly carry more urgency and are less filtered than fortnightly or even weekly reports. I mean, do you actually bother to send something if it's looking back on the whole week or more? Well, uh, travel is frequently mentioned. Um, <clears throat> the hospitality received by the officials of the telegraph companies, both British and Persian, especially when alternative comforts and accommodation in the chapar khanes or caravanserais, which frequently followed the same routes, were either lacking or unpalatable. And if we want, well, one, one way of collecting an idea of Iran is the comments of these Europeans, particularly traveling around, and the appalling accommodations uh, they encountered on the way. But they were still pretty intrepid, actually, I must say. It's amazing how they put up with what most of us wouldn't even dream of doing, even when we were students, hitchhiking. Um, Wills himself was a medical doctor serving in the British Government Telegraph Department. So, so that's the Chapach Army. Okay, this is one plank of this. It started around the 1850s, the organization of new um, relay posts and, and the building of them. Some of them are reported as being new and some are dilapidated and so on. But this is one plank of the communications network. The Telegraph, the second one, not long after the revival of the Chapa relay um, network, uh, the use of electric telegraph was initiated, first with the encouragement of Malcolm Khan, and connections were made with Sultania, the Shah's summer encampment, first, and then on to Tabriz in 1858 to 1860 with the um, help of assist technical assistance from the Dal Fanun uh, people. This was later updated and extended when in 1868 the Shah gave Siemens a private company a contract to continue the line to the Russian border, whence it eventually continued to London under Russian control. Mm. The increased traffic to Tehran via this company, a private company, spurred growth on the system for the rest of Iran to accommodate travel, uh, traffic onwards from Iran to India. And this was the establishment of the Indo-European Telegraph Department as opposed to the company. In 1863, the British, alarmed by the Indian mutiny of 1857 and the need for rapid communications, negotiated the establishment of the Indo-European Telegraph Department as a branch of the government of India. I mean, this is all well known. As I say, I'm just trying to put these um, building blocks together. Direct communications with London across Iran from Khan uh, in Iraq to Bushir and thence onward by submarine cable through the Persian Gulf via Guador started in 1865, so not long after the establishment of the Chapa Khani network. Thereafter it expanded considerably in the north to Rasht 1869, Astrabad 1870, Mashhad 1876 and in the south to Kirman in 1879. This is a map I produced years ago, <laughs> only long ago, uh, to show the network of information coming in um, on, <coughs> when I was looking at earthquakes at the time, but also other natural disasters. Of course, one of the things that are quite frequently reported. Once the telegraph network was established, the speeds of communication were naturally extremely rapid. 
the commencement of the company system set up by Siemens shortened Indo-European communications from 12 days to 6 minutes. So it's quite sort of quantum jump that the motor car and the internet has produced now. This depended, however, on the maintenance and functionality of the lines. For the present purposes, communications within Iran it may be necessary to distinguish the Government of India's official line, the department line, between India and London, and the Persian government lines, which were established in parallel and apparently used or able to be used by both. This is a slightly murky area. I haven't um, completely distinguished which lines were which. The distinction is not always clear, and the running of the lines was transfer transferred sometimes from one authority to another. Various reports, however, record the considerable intervals when the network was not functioning. So if you want to know when information is coming, you need to know actually if the telegraph line was working at that period or not. Uh, it all goes down to um, the availability of news, and of course there's no news if there's no way of communicating it. In um, 1879, Priest noted that the Tehran Mashhad line, which had been open for only three years earlier, was so bad that it was often down and generally was open only two days a week, and the other lines were no better. In 1891, Bidulf, a well-known traveller, described the deplorable state of the line between Rasht and Kazvin, and the line up to Enzeli also, incidentally, was an important one, obviously. Um, the lines running on poles that sometimes had insulators and sometimes not, and often just stretching between the branches of the trees going through the jungle, in other words, no proper system. Incidentally, there's a beautiful story, which I read once and haven't been able to find since, that the line running down the southern line uh, was uh, impeded by the fact that the Bakhtiari tribesmen were going along shooting, bang, 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 the insulator caps on the <laughs> wires. If anyone knows where, well, I, I might have read that reference. <laughs> Good to find it again. So it was like this marksmanship going down the line, knocking out all the insulated caps on the lines. In 1895, the lines from Mashhad were interrupted for, to Kalat, 104 days, with Kuchan, 133 days, with Sarax, 112 days, with Buchanan, 356 days, and with Daragos, 361. In other words, that line was only working four days in the year. In comparison, this smug British operated line from Tehran to Masha, it was only uh, down ten and a half days in the first nine months of the year, we're talking about 1895, of which three days were due to the absence of the opera, so it's a bit like the British Rail. <laughs> in 1899, there was some improvement of Masha, Kalat down was 21 days out of action, Kalat down again is 80 days, and Masha, so at 62 days. So, but nevertheless, these are significant intervals uh, when the lines were not active. And so, as in the case of the so-called postal network, the question is significant regarding the question of how quickly and, of course, how regularly news might be dispatched and received, uh, as well as regarding which destinations were connected and how extensive was the coverage. coverage. This map goes way up into the um, early 20th century, so it's not uh, typical of what's actually uh, in the period I'm focusing on, which is the first sort of 30 years of Nasruddin Shah's reign, before the political troubles started, because that produced uh, an enormous uh, further um, increase in information and, and also in the type of information that was being communicated. Well, <clears throat> so this becomes relevant when one considers the establishment of the newspaper press in Iran and the extent to which the telegraph network became an important source of news and therefore its subsequent circulation. So this is the third plank of my um, scaffold. So on the newspapers, as recorded by E.G. Brown and many others, the first Persian newspaper was Ruznamé Vakaya Isifarpié, established in February 1851, and continued with a change of name to 1860, uh, as the Ruznamé Dolati Ali Iran, supplying government. A decade later, with a merger of three separate titles, it continued as Ruz Iran from 1271. So we have the first one, 51 to 60, 60 to 71, and then Ruz Iran, starting on the 2nd of April 1871, which actually continued way up into the, uh, uh, into the 20th century. 
This was under the auspices of the new press department, later a ministry, headed by Mohammed Hassan Khan, Sani Adoule, later Itimada Saltana, whose role, of course, was very important in uh, all these developments. Uh, he was the um, um, press minister of Nasruddin Shah, ultimately. I might leave out what they say. Except to just say there was a mixture of foreign news. It was largely court news, quite a lot of foreign news, um, quite a lot of translations of European uh, material, travel books and other things. You know, I was found even one of them the other day was travelling a uh, translation of Stout Cortez's <laughs> travels in Mexico in the early 16th century. So, I mean, there was a terrific uh, aim to open up the outside world, <coughs> excuse me, in its literature. Uh, and it's interesting to notice that, um, although I haven't looked systematically, news by telegraph was as received as in the papers as early as 1865. So right from the beginning, really, uh, of the news of the telegraph network being established, um, telegraphic news was being recorded in the newspapers, in this case from Azerbaijan, which, as I mentioned, is one of the first lines to be connected anyway. So to sum up... <coughs> I haven't finished, don't worry. <laughs> to sum up, at this point, starting with the first decade of the reign of Nasruddin Shah, three more or less interrelated institutions were established that contributed to the production and circulation of news. The relay system, the Chapa Khanis, the telegraph network, and the Persian press. And all these combined to provide sources of information uh, for a local audience. As these were almost all government-sponsored operations, the main audience was government officials who were obliged to purchase them, but also the court elite and presumably merchants and others. And despite barely 5% literacy, even in the cities, uh, it seems that the papers could be read out in villages and towns across the country. I'll cut out what that meant for the Europeans. But just to say, um, as I mentioned, the Iranians themselves start to record their travels. Um, though, uh, not a very recent count, actually now, uh, 10 years ago, over 280 travel counts were noted, over half in the reign of Nasruddin Shah, partly it's inspired by his example. Around about 75 of these, or nearly 40%, concern travels within Iran. Um, tracing these in bibliographical sources highlights, that's to say bibliographies as well as uh, manuscript catalogues, highlights uh, an important point, I think, a blurring of genre and categorization between memoirs, which you might call khatirat, or tazkire, even a, a mention, a memorial of a, a journey, uh, and travelogues, or safan uh, And um, so these, these different uh, types of book, or actually tended to contain much of the same sort of information. Um, it highlights these uh, different genres and the, um, the extent to which this information penetrated into mainstream historiography uh, and the production of court chronicles. So that's my fourth plank. Uh, this can be demonstrated very briefly um, by the way the Kajar Shah's travels are reported and later recorded in considerable detail. <coughs> Um, I'll leave out this bit. <clears throat> it's clear comparing, for instance, the well, quite well documented journeys of Fatali Shah, which just say he went there and he came back then. Um, Nasruddin Shah's um, travel logs, the decision not just to travel so much, but also to record his uh, journeys, uh, makes it clear how he saw them as a means to promote an image of himself. So we're not talking about his image in Iran, uh, in Europe now, an image of himself as an effective and committed presence throughout the protected realms, the extent and knowledge of which he was anxious to proclaim, um, which um, Magme Sofrabi has wrote a very nice article about this, uh, the three aspects of legitimacy, diplomacy, and knowledge production, and specifically um, geographical knowledge partly through the media already noticed, the posts and the telegraphs and the papers, but also in the historical literature. 
notably in the annals of the reign compiled by the Itamada Sultan, who I mentioned, his press chief, Minister of Press from 1883 onwards. So what sort of news are we talking about, briefly? Um, <clears throat> as noted, the emphasis is on court and government business, the change of appointments and the activities of the monarch, with a variety of domestic and foreign news. In the present context, we may note that Nasruddin Shah's journey to Khorasan in um, April to October 1867 is recorded in detail in a sequence of issues of the paper Ruznami Dolati Aliye Iran and chronicled in similar extensive details with the exact itinerary in um, Sonia Dola's Montezemi Nasri, which is a sort of chronicle in a way. I mean, it's not really a proper historical narrative, but it's an analytic uh, record of uh, the reign. And the same can be said of the Shah's journey to Gilan from October 1867 to March 1870, reported in the paper almost as it happened. It's worth noting the Shah was away a long time. I mean, October 1867 to March 1870, just in Gilan. It's not just journeys. This is a, a ruler who is going around the country, staying there, dealing with local officials, uh, not unlike Shah Abbas, actually. Which is uh, it's another aspect of this. It's not so much relevant to the question of communication, but I think the peripatetic monarchy has not been actually sufficiently emphasized in talking about the, um, the Qajar court. Uh, and then his important journeys to the Atabat in Ottoman Iraq the same year, the same year he was away from September 1870 uh, until February 1871, recorded serially and immediately in the newspaper, and then later in the Shah's own travelogue. Uh, so we're seeing um, a production of information that puts the Shah. Oh, I think that's good. I need to finish. Uh, puts the Shah in the same sort of level of activity and self-imaging that we saw in David's paper on uh, the Shah in, in Europe. It's the same idea, but he's not just doing it in Europe. He's doing it in Iran as well. And therefore, people in Iran are seeing the Shah and seeing that he's travelling and that he's dealing with the local officials. And of course, this is a way of of establishing control, partly, um, but also finding out about the uh, um, territory that he's um, the ruler of, which of course, unfortunately, is a shrinking territory. So I've now got some jolly pictures, uh, not, not very good ones, um, to uh, illustrate some of the newspapers. A further dimension to the news is given by illustrations when it comes to providing an idea that one could see as well as read about. So there's a rare, rather flaky image in the Dolat Ali Iran depicting the Shah's and probably, I think there are probably better copies of this sort of thing all over the place. But um, <clears throat> in um, Jajrud in 1866, he was there frequently. Again, this is the whole idea of summer and winter courses, alternation, uh, getting out of the stuffy capital in Tehran into the, into the you know, mountain valleys. Uh, a newspaper, uh, there were very few illustrations in this, in this paper, but a later publication, the newspaper, so called newspaper, Sharaf, and it's a periodical um, every month, uh, provides regular images of the Shah's activities alongside official portraits of leading courtiers, including a hunt. I quite like this one because um, the, the paper has the account of the hunt, but actually, if those of you blessed, so, so this is a, a nice illustration. Well, you can see it in the Shah newspaper. It's got the details of the day. So this is a monthly thing. So this is an example. Uh, so this is the sort of news people might want to read. Um, so the Shah sets off for Mashhad in June 1883. That's a pretty heroic picture. You know, he's not just sitting there at home behind his desk. Uh, he's off for quite a, a, a long trip. Uh, construction of the Masjid in Nasiri in Tehran. I think, is this the. Uh, uh, this is, sorry, yes, this has been, this is a description of the thing. So this is in the newspaper. This is the detailed itinerary of his um, uh, journey to Mashhad and back, which is also documented in his own travel. So there's no escaping it, in other words. It's one thing writing a book that no one's going to read, but it's in the newspapers as well. 
Uh, and then this is the construction of the work on the Masjid in Nasiri. I'm not sure which mosque this is. I mean, I don't have time to. Is, is it the Sabah Salah? Do you know if that's the Masjid in Nasiri? I don't know which one. You know which one is. Anyway, it's in Tehran, so it's probably got a new name now. As well as, this is the coup de grace, uh, pictures of Queen Victoria the like guitar, uh, reflecting the Shah's European travels. So, in other words, the newspapers are a way of helping people, illustrated newspapers, a way of people actually seeing things they might read about that they'd never actually go and see themselves. It makes it obviously far more immediate. Um, I'm going to cut out the conclusions, because I think they're fairly obvious in a way, and I said basically why this is all interesting. There's one aspect that I didn't have time to cover, and I'm not quite sure how to do so, so I'm in in inviting your help. One of the, well, that well, Paris conference I mentioned actually was in Avignon years ago about the circulation des nouvelles, uh, addressed the question of rumour rather than just you know, news circulating by rumour rather than by official publications. Uh, so far I've only found one article just by googling Charlier <laughs> in person uh, on the internet and I found a very interesting article by a lady called Zahra Cherog, uh, Cherogi, it's quite old, 2011, uh, and she discusses, I only read it very, very briefly, um, clearly rumours circulating sort of various events. One is the murder of Grigoyedov, you know, the uh, Russian ambassador in Tehran. One is the death of Amir Kabir. One is the banning on smoking, in other words, the start of the tobacco thing. One on the death of Nasruddin Shah, and then the Darcy concession. And I think what she's getting at is that there's the official account of these things, but what people were <coughs> thinking about is and how news travel. And I don't know how one would measure that, actually, uh, almost by definition. But I think if you... I know that all these khasirat and memoirs, and if people start writing, it is said that, or I heard that, or in the bazaar they're saying this, this would be a way of trying to document this sort of, uh, sort of second level of the circulation of news, which I think would be a topic, be, maybe someone's already done something about it, but um, this would be something I would like to see more about myself. And then finally, on the question of the, the rumour, the only thing I saw just by chance reading through Wills's um, um, book about Persia recently, um, apparently when he was travelling to Isfahan in July 1877, he was at Yazdikhast, and he just notes, I quote, People here report the king's death and there is a great panic. Well, I think it's a good way to end. Uh, but the fact is that I don't know what was behind that rumour. Maybe he was ill. Anyway, it's interesting. So thank you very much for your attention.